It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. My question is to the Premier. Municipal leaders across Ontario have been speaking out against the Ford government's cuts to everything from childcare to public health to flood management. Ministers in the Ford government, meanwhile, insist that they want to have a respectful dialogue. But they also state that the cuts will proceed, no matter how reckless and poorly planned they are. How can the government claim to be having a discussion when it appears that all the decisions have already been made? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Referred to the Minister of Children, much, Community uh, and Social Premier. Services. Uh, we'll talk about the municipal issues, uh, but I want to pick up on what the member said about a respectful dialogue. We need to address what happened on the lawn yesterday. Quite an event took place. The NDP had at least two members at a protest, the member from Davenport and the member from Windsor West. At the same time, mass protesters brought a bloodied guillotine to the grounds of Queen's Park. And you know what they did? They beheaded an effigy of the Premier. This is disgusting, and it is a sick act that has been condoned Order. by the opposition. I am asking the members opposite to condemn yesterday's protest, apologize for their attendance at yesterday's event, but it's important to know that this is the real NDP, and we have seen it on the attacks against the Minister of Labour's office, Response. the accosting and attacking of me, resulting in OPP protection for members of our cabinet. They care more about activism and protesting than respect Order. We all know we have free speech in this legislature. We have certain privileges as members of the legislature to participate in debates. But the language and the, and the comments have to be parliamentary, considered to be parliamentary. I'm going to caution the members at the outset that the language has to be parliamentary, we, or we will quickly have to go to warnings. And, and following that, of course, the, the, uh, the option of naming members is, uh, is within the purview of the Speaker. I'm going to have a question period today, and I hope we have a reasonable dialogue on the issues facing the province. Start the clock. Supplementary. Earlier this week, the mayors of Ontario's 28 largest municipalities pleaded with the province to reverse budget cuts to childcare, public health, flood management, and more. Smaller municipalities are speaking up as well. The town of Prescott has called on the province to stop cuts to public health and library services. The mayor of Dryden said his community has been treated like, and I quote, a financial punching bag for the province, end of quote. This doesn't sound like people or municipalities who are, feel respected. Will the government listen to municipal leaders, reverse these cuts, and have an actual discussion about how Ontarians are being impacted? The question has been referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to refer back to the Premier. Questions referred back to the Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, the Minister for her comments. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I normally don't get concerned uh, too much about the activist protests outside and on the, on the front lawns of uh, Queen's Park, but we're, we're here to represent the real people, the real people that can't afford to take the day off or can't afford to get paid to go to protest. The people that are working in the back of the factories, the people that are working in the offices across this province trying to make ends meet, those are the people that we're here for. But yesterday went a little too far. My friends, when any, any time a politician, no matter what party it is, uh, has a, a guillotine out there, uh, I think that, that goes a little too far. Matter of fact, it goes way overboard, Mr. Speaker. But the difference is, that's what the opposition believes in, supporting folks like that. Response. We support, we support the people that are out in the factories and the offices trying to make ends meet, paying their taxes and wanting services. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. The sad fact is the Ford government doesn't want to hear from anyone other than obedience. 
whether it's the acting premier insisting that she's not even willing to consider pausing cuts to public health care, or the premier taking out as a frustration on the man who beat him in Toronto's mayoral elections, the people of Ontario need different levels of government to work together. Instead, we have one side scrambling to provide everything from school breakfast to flood protection and a premier who seems to ignore their complaints. How does that help the people of Ontario? Premier? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Do you know who got us in this position, Mr. Speaker? The NDP put us in this position. The Liberals put us in this position with a $15 billion deficit, with a $347 billion debt, largest in the world, sub-sovereign debt in the entire world. That's who put us in this position. We're driving efficiencies. We're putting more money, $700 million more, into education. The Minister of Education is doing an incredible job. The Minister of Health is doing an incredible job ending hallway health care by putting $1.3 billion into health care, making sure that we have 15,000 long-term care beds. We're well over 7,000 long-term care beds. They worry about jobs. Again, the people in the factory, as I was speaking about earlier, Mr. Speaker, these people are working 10, 12 hours a day, a day, trying to pay their taxes, trying to pay their mortgage, Response. trying to put food on their table. That's what people are concerned about. They want the economy to get going, and that's what this government is doing by lowering taxes, making sure we create an environment for companies to thrive and prosper. And again, thank you. Stop the clock. Thank you. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Later today, the Ford government will be tabling legislation to begin their takeover of Toronto's transit system. And the Premier has made it clear his plan is going ahead, no matter how much Order. delay it causes or what anyone else in this province has to say about it. If the province has already made up its mind, what are they hoping to accomplish with their negotiations in the City of Toronto then? To the, the great Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the member opposite for that question. You know, last uh, June uh, we won an election based on the fact that we would upload the TTC and expand service for all for all the people using, uh, utilizing the TTC and the GTHA, creating a regional uh, integrated transportation network. Mr. Speaker, in August, we appointed Michael Lindsay as our chief uh, special advisor to negotiate with the City of Toronto on bringing the upload towards, uh, in, into reality. And in uh, February, we signed a terms of reference, Mr. Speaker, that uh, set out provisions of how we will work together with the city through discussions and how the upload will go forward. April 11th, Mr. Speaker, we announced $28.5 billion expansion for the City of Toronto and their subway system. Uh, there's a lot of people excited about it, and we need Response. to make that happen, Mr. Speaker. And the legislation we're tabling today will enable the government to uh, take over the expansion and growth of the TTC network, and we're going to continue those talks with the City of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, again, the member for Brampton Centre. Speaker, the City of Toronto has actually put forward 61 key questions about the Ford government's transit plans, including basic requests like how they arrived at their cost estimates and who was paid to prepare them. Has the province answered any of those questions, and if so, uh, when do they intend to share this with the public? Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, we will continue our negotiations with uh, the City of Toronto. Uncle Lindsay meets on a regular basis. I have conversations with Mayor Tory, and, and everything's been positive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on with the, the opposition. They're, they're a little inconsistent in their messaging. On one hand, they're saying, don't download things. On the next hand, they're saying, don't upload things. I don't know where they stand on any issue, Mr. Oh, Speaker, other than saying right. no, no, no to anything this government does towards balancing this, yeah. the budget and delivering great transit projects, historic transit projects to the, to the City of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, we are in good conversations with the City of Toronto with regards to the expansions. Uh, we, uh, Minister McNaughton, Ministry of Infrastructure, is in constant uh, uh, talks with the federal government. Hopefully, they'll put the money forward uh, to support our historic expansion of the transit system within this province. We'll continue the discussions with Mayor Tory and his staff, but at the end of the day, Mr. Response. Speaker, the system isn't working for the riders of the TTC, and we made a pledge to make it better, and that's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. 
Speaker, the people of Toronto deserve transit solutions that get them out of gridlock. Instead, they have a government that's ripping up plans and unwilling or unable to answer basic questions as they attempt a hostile takeover of the subway system. Instead of plowing ahead with a scheme that will add costs and delay Toronto's transit system, why won't the Ford government stop dismissing concerns that people are raising in this province and answer some key questions about their plan? Minister Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, on, on April 11th, we announced the historic uh, vision that we see for the, pro uh, the city of Toronto as we as we move to expand transit opportunities. Mr. Speaker, the people of Toronto have been waiting decades for the relief line to be built, but it only gets stopped because there's continual bickering and returning to the table uh, year after year with different councils. They just can't get it done. The, the system isn't working, Mr. Speaker. What we're going to do is upload that responsibility uh, to the province, and we're going to get this, this job done. We're going to make the Ontario line, Mr. Speaker, all the way from the uh, uh, Ontario Place up to the Ontario Science Centre, Mr. Speaker. We're going to build subways into Scarborough. First time ever. Those people have been waiting decades themselves for a subway. Not just one stop, Mr. Speaker, three stops, and that's what the people deserve. Oh. Mr. Speaker, we're going to extend the Edmonton West. We're going to take it out underground into the Tobacco and hopefully join it up with the airport. And finally, Mr. Speaker, we are going to connect Richmond Hill and Newmarket to our subway system. We're going to get the economy going by getting people moving in this province. Next question. The member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Today, the Conservative government is introducing its bill to begin the takeover of the TTC. Despite the fact that the province is still in negotiations with the City of Toronto regarding the upload, and there are numerous outstanding questions that the Pro uh, Premier has refused to answer. Mr. Speaker, how can the Premier claim to be negotiating with the city in good faith when he is going behind their back to push through this hostile takeover? I don't really believe that. I, I, is someone going to respond on behalf of the government? No. They will do it. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, Minister Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I, I can just reiterate what I just answered previously. Um, we've been working with the City of Toronto since November with our special advisor appointed in August uh, on working towards creating a new partnership with the City of Toronto and the province of Ontario. We both know the current system isn't working to get subways built in the city, and we're, we're, we're stuck at gridlock. People aren't utilizing the transit system like they should because it's not offering the opportunities for them to go from point A to point B, to get from home to work and back home and be with friends and families. It's just not happening, Mr. Speaker. And it's unfortunate the opposition party is pushing back so hard on this when the people of Toronto, the people of the GTHA, want proper transit, and it's not getting built, unfortunately, and we are able to do it, and that's why we're working with the City of Toronto through our negotiations, through our Response. terms of reference that we put forward to build and grow the TTC and create the uh, integrated regional network that the people of Toronto and the GTHA deserve. And Mr. Speaker, you know, it's going to be great news for the people of Toronto when this is done. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Transportation admitted that some of the work the city has already completed for the downtown relief line is no longer usable. That means millions of dollars and months of work that went into the planning and developing of that line is essentially being thrown out and replaced with the back of the napkin plan cooked up by the Premier. We all know what happens when transit plans are ripped up. There's more delays, there's more uncertainty, and it makes it even less likely that transit will be built. How can the Premier justify throwing out the city's work on the downtown relief line and the delays and additional expenses that are going to result? Minister. To the Premier. Referred to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the local member from uh, Rosedale. What an insult you just gave to all the bright minds at Infrastructure Ontario, some of the smartest people in the world saying back of a napkin. You know, they, they came up with a plan with them. Leading the charge was the Minister of Transportation and MTO, insulting all MTO, insulting everyone at Metrolinx. Yeah. That could honestly, Mr. Speaker, run circles around anyone in the opposition when they talk about <laughs> transit. They know what they're talking about. They know what a world-class subway system is. They came up with an incredible plan. And the crown jewel, the crown jewel is the Ontario line running from Ontario Place up to Ontario Science Centre. And 
Mr. Speaker, actually running through Spons. a lot of the NDP ridings. I'm sure, I'm sure their constituents would be more than happy to utilize the new subway system that the Minister of Transportation is putting in GTA. Hear, hear. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier of Ontario. For over a week now, we have been experiencing floods in many parts of the province, including my city of Ottawa. Our hardworking first responders have been hard at work to prevent damage to communities and homes in coordination with our emergency management partners. And our government understands the impact and severity of the flooding, and we take the safety of our communities seriously. I know that people in my riding of Carleton were reassured to see the Premier visit several of the municipalities currently under a state of emergency in order to see the conditions firsthand and to assist our hardworking first responders with relief efforts. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Premier please update the House on what measures the province is taking to respond to this ongoing situation? Questions to the Premier. Well, I, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the great MPP from Carleton, the absolute champion. I, I was up in Carleton, Mr. Speaker. You want to talk about a popular MPP. When I was up there, I went and visited a, a, senior, a senior's home. And, they love the MPP from Carleton. Incredible job. But do you, do you know who, do you know who we love as, as well, Mr. Speaker? We love the first responders and the military folks. Look, look at those champions up there. Absolute champions. I absolutely love you. You're the, one of the best in the world. Mr. Speaker, when I was in Ottawa, it was like the cavalry coming Response. over the mountain when we saw the military. They came in, they were sandbagging, helping people because the people in Ottawa were exhausted. I just got off the phone with Mayor Watson, making sure and reassuring him that he has the province to support on anything he needs. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you uh, to the Premier for that response, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your kind words and for visiting the Care Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, while our government is hard at work responding to floods, the opposition continues to fearmonger about the ability of Ontario's conservation authorities to respond to flood events. I'd like to read them a quote from Rhonda Bateman, the General Manager of the Sault Ste. Marie Regional Conservation Authority. We are not going to cut the maintenance and flood control program. That can't be done. Perhaps the member from Thunder Bay at Ticocan was not aware that managing water-related hazards are part of the programs and services conservation authorities are mandated to provide. Can the Premier please clarify our government's proposal to make conservation authorities more efficient and effective? Thank you. Questions to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, again, I, I want to thank the MPP from Carleton. We went up. They, they're all all-stars. You're right. Unfortunately, you don't have any. Anyways, uh, to, you, to you, Mr. Speaker. To, to you, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, I talked to the mayor of Ottawa. He appreciates the help from the Solicitor General, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, the Minister of Natural Resources. It's all hands on deck, no matter if it's Ottawa. Speaking to the mayor of Huntsville, which I'm going to be heading up to uh, Huntsville and Bracebridge, and spoke to the mayor of Muskoka Lakes. They're so grateful yep. for our support. We're sparing no expense. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, we're putting five million additional dollars to protect the watershed up in Muskoka. Again, I'm traveling up there uh, tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, to see firsthand how we're progressing. And once again, <clears throat> the first responders and the great military is up in Muskoka working their backs off. We want to thank them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolute chip. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to start by again uh, acknowledging all the amazing education workers and students and parents and trustees from the Toronto Catholic District School Board who are here today. 
questions to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, educational assistants, custodians, clerical workers, library staff, and language instructors all play a crucial role in supporting Ontario students and keeping our community schools safe. Yet so far, we have at least 2,500 education worker positions in jeopardy because of this government's cuts to our schools. And that's just the beginning, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister set aside her talking points and admit that the government's radical changes to class sizes and cuts to programs will mean Order. less jobs and less support for our students? Order. Come inside, come to order. Questions to the Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, first of all, I would like to stand in this House and sincerely request the member opposite to absolutely condemn the actions of the prote protesters yesterday afternoon here at Queen's Park that she is with. I ask her to stand up and show some leadership and show some respect for the institution known as Queen's Park and, for, and show respect for the elected officials in this house. Her order. actions have been absolutely disgusting, and I feel very strongly that we need to see leadership from this member absolutely opposite. Right. She needs to condemn yesterday's actions that she actually was out observing and possibly participating in, and quite frankly, she needs to stand up and take responsibility for incenting this type of activity. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I can see that the minister doesn't want to answer the question, but I'm going to go back at her again. Speaker. Order. Order. <laughs> Member for Davenport has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is about more than numbers on a balance sheet. This is about the programs and the people who make our schools the absolute heart of our communities. This is about the Government services side, come to order. and the supports that help our children learn and thrive. But this government's actions will remove thousands and thousands of caring adults from schools, shut up programs and courses, and leave kids with a bare minimum. Speaker, some of these students and workers are here in the gallery with us today because their international languages program is at risk. They deserve to know, Minister, Order. will the minister reverse her education cuts and start investing in our kids? Member for Mississauga East Cooksville must come to order. The member for Eglinton Lawrence must come to order. The Minister for Children, Community and Social Services must come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Education reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure this is your house. I am sure you were devastated to see what different type of personalities have brought to this institution and to the students that are here in the public galleries today. I hope you understand back. that this is not the norm. This is not the way it has been the last eight years that I have been in this house. It is all unacceptable because of the behaviour that has been happening. But trust, trust that I am going to lead by example. I say this to all of you because we can't. I'm going to ask the minister to make her comments through the chair. I'm going to ask the member for uh, Niagara Centre to come to order. Through you, Speaker, to the people in the audience today in the public galleries and everyone watching, we're going to get education back on track. Here, here. We know educations are absolutely imperative to enhancing the learning environment in every single classroom in Ontario, Spons. and we are going to stand by them and make sure that all, not only the GSN will be appropriately applied to enhance the learning environment in the classroom for teachers and students. We're going to make sure. Thank you. Stop the clock. The member. For, next question. Start the clock. The member for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. 
Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Minister of Finance. In our budget, we made it clear that we're putting people first. From day one, our government has put the people at the centre of every decision we make. Whether we're putting more money in people's pockets by reducing licensing fees, providing relief for childcare expenses, or giving a tax break to low-income earners, we will always focus on directly improving the lives of the people of Ontario. Our proposed changes to the estate administration tax reflect this commitment once again. Could the minister please explain how our proposed changes to the state administration tax put people first and provide support and compassion to Ontario families and individuals? Questions to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and to the member from Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Last week, we were pleased to join the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing in Brockville to highlight the changes we're proposing to the estate administration tax. Our plan to make life easier and more affordable for the people of Ontario starts with giving people relief, particularly in times of worry and grief when they need it the most. That is why our legislation, if passed, would eliminate the estate tax on the estates uh, under $50,000 and provide a tax cut of $250 on all larger estates. Our proposed changes are about compassion, respect for families, and putting people first during a very difficult period in their lives. We intend to provide relief for families during their greatest time of need. Their government Response. should be working for them, especially at this time, not against them. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's clear that this is a compassionate thing to do and the right thing to do, Speaker. I could not be more proud of a government that is supporting people in their most difficult times. As part of our plan to put people first, we're also making it easier for people to interact and work with the government. The current requirements for filing the estate tax are burdensome and unfair. Our government has put forward another step to support families dealing with the death of a loved one. Could the minister please explain how our government intends to make it easier to file the estate tax? Minister Thank you, uh, Speaker, we intend to make it easier to file the estate tax returns by extending the filing deadlines. If passed, our legislation would extend the filing deadlines from 90 days to 180 days so that grieving families will have more time to respond to the death of a loved one. The deadline for filing amendments to the returns would also be extended from 30 days to 60 days. The last thing a family should worry about after losing a family member is red tape and taxes. Unfortunately, that is something the previous government, backed by the NDP, just did not understand when they changed that. Our proposed changes back would offer compassionate support speaker to families during Response. these very difficult times and we're also exploring options to include tax relief for charitable donations thank you speaker next question the member for scarborough southwest thank you speaker my question is to the minister of education Yesterday, we learned that 44 municipalities out of 47 will have their general allocation funds for child care cut in 2019. General allocation funds pay for the day-to-day -day operating costs of child care centers and subsidi subsidies to low-income families. With child care costs spiraling to as much as $20,000 a year for some families, parents are at a breaking point trying to find affordable child care. So why is this government choosing to make cuts to child care that will make life more expensive for families and parents? Right. Minister of Education. Well, actually, Speaker, I absolutely reject the premise that came from the member across the floor because, quite frankly, we're making life more affordable for parents across this province. And, you know, we have to make sure that people watching, through you, Speaker, to everyone watching and listening today, that what the member opposite was talking about was a one-time funding to clean up 
a knee-jerk mistake that the former Liberal government made. You know, they increased minimum wage by 20 per cent. They realized the disastrous impacts that that would have on daycares across Ontario, so they had to put a Band-Aid on the, the gouge they made in daycare through this $50 million fund. And so I want to share with you, Speaker, a quote from at the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario. From what we can tell, the $50 million in fee stabilization Spons. support was simply handed to municipal governments, which then were left to develop their own systems for administrating it. Not only was the funding stream poorly designed by the Liberal government, in many cases it was extremely poorly delivered by the municipalities. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, I think through the uh, Speaker, I think we agree on one thing. The Liberals did have a lot of Band-Aid solutions, but you're taking it even worse. You're taking it back even more and making it worse for families and definitely not making it affordable. The government is also changing cost-sharing requirements for municipalities and eliminating fee uh, stabilization funding. All these cuts actually add up to $90 million taken from our child care system this year. Speaker, this government promised parents a tax credit that doesn't even come close to covering the cost of child care. Then they eliminate the funding that controls child care fees. Parents deserve so much better than this shell game. Will the minister commit right now to reversing these cuts and instead choose to invest in our child care for our future? Thank you very much. Minister of Education, so speaker, I would like to share a little bit of advice to the member opposite. Stop the fear-mongering because you're losing credibility within the sector because the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario actually said it's important Order. to put this news in the context of the recent provincial budget announcement about the CARE tax credit, which is going to help 300,000 families. The CARE tax credit is great news Opposition for families. Come to order. It's a simpler, more child-centred approach to funding that helps almost every family with young children. It gives parents more choices with very little added administrative cost and no municipal red tape. People like what we've done. Accept it. Order. Next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And uh, I want to begin, Mr. Speaker, by thanking the Minister and the Premier and the Finance Minister and the government for the uh, support of both the Alliston and Collingwood Hospitals in the recent budget. That was fan fantastic. And and uh, notwithstanding the two questions I'm about to ask you, we are, we are grateful. Um, this, <laughs> Minister, as you know, Hospice Georgian Triangle in Collingwood continues to wait for operational funding for four of their ten beds. These four beds have been sitting, sitting idle at the direction of the Lynn and are not allowed to be used even if the hospice wants to fund the beds themselves. Uh, Minister, does the government have any plans to fund these empty beds? And if not, can you please explain to my constituents why that can't be done at this time? Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I, I thank the member very much for the question, and uh, I want to assure the member and all Ontarians that our government is committed to supporting high-quality palliative and end-of-life care services for anyone in Ontario who needs it. That, uh, these services are provided by people across the province, both in um, hospitals, hospices, home and community care settings, long-term care and other places. And that is why we were very proud to announce last year that our government is investing $33.6 million to move forward with 193 new hospice beds across the province, which includes over $20 million annually for annual nursing support and other support services that are required. So the specific question that you've asked me about, I understand, is still under discussion with the ministry. We will continue those discussions, and um, we will have an answer for the people of your riding uh, very shortly. So thank, thank you. you very much. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, uh, thank you very much to the, uh, to the minister. Uh, minister Matthews House Hospice in Alliston uh, sent you a cost-saving analysis back in January to show the overall savings that investments in hospice care can have particularly with respect to community services. Matthews House Hospice not only provides residential care, as you know, uh, for people at end stages of life, they also provide community programs to help those who are not able to go to hospice. 
This can include things like pain and symptom management and expanded pediatric and mental health supports. The uh, hospice wants to do more. So will the government provide the additional funding so that the hospital can provide more community services? Once again, Minister of Health. Thank you. There is no question that hospice care or home care also that can be provided in the home for palliative and end-of-life services is certainly more cost-effective than a stay in hospital. It's also more patient-centered. That's what we're doing with our transformation, with our modernization of our health care service, to make sure that we center care around the patients, families and caregivers. That's what we want for people who are ending their last days, to be able to be in a non-clinical care setting, home-like setting as much as possible, if not in their own home, with their family and friends around them. And I want to really thank everyone who works in our hospices and the many wonderful volunteers that come forward to help them for their exemplary care. They go to great lengths to make sure that people can spend their last days in comfort with the things that are most familiar surrounding them, including especially, of course, their families. So we will continue those discussions with respect to those additional hospice beds in your community. Oh, well thank, you. Well, thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. We inherited a broken Ontario Autism program that left 23,000 children languishing on a waiting list. A further 2,400 children were waiting for a diagnostic assessment through Ontario Five Diagnostic Hubs. Throughout, throughout it all, I, uh, we have listened to families who ask for additional enhancements, and we will continue to listen, as our motivation has always been to ensure that every children with autism services support from their Ontario government. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is listening and acting to better support all children with autism? Questions to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to say thank you also to the member opposite uh, from our party, of course, who's been a strong advocate for the people of his community, but particularly for children with autism. So thank you very much. Speaker, as you're aware, my primary motivation has been and always will be to clear the 23,000 children who are languishing on a wait list uh, and get that cleared so that they can get support from their Ontario government. Uh, three out of four children were not receiving support. That's why we doubled our investment into the diagnostic hubs, and we provided choice for what parents uh, uh, want, want to use in terms of supports for their children. Last night, over 400 people participated in a telephone town hall to tell us how we can best approach a needs-based system with an additional $300 million that was provided to us through the Treasury and by our Premier. Uh, we have also over 200 people that have already, or, sorry, over 600 people that have already applied to our online survey at ontario.ca forward slash autism. And next week I'll be appointing an expert panel who will work directly with me and provide advice on how we can have the best Ontario autism program in the province's history. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for affirming your commitment to listening and taking action to support families of children with autism. Minister, since day one, you have been working tirelessly to support all families of children and youth with autism. Your work has reformed the Ontario Autism Program to provide funding directly to parents to choose the services that are right for them. I am pleased to know that a full list of eligible services is now available online and has been expanded to include speech language and occupational service. I will continue to seek input from families in my riding of Mississauga Erin Mills to help inform additional enhancement to the Ontario Autism Program. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain why government launches those consultations starting off yesterday? Minister to reply. Speaker, I'm very proud that we were um, able to not only increase the investment from $256 million to $321 million, but then add an additional $300 million so that we could go to a needs-based system and consult with uh, the people who matter most. That's moms and dads, clinicians, and uh, those who work in the field. That's why next week I'll be appointing the expert panel. I'll continue to work with the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health as we leverage a whole-of-government approach to support those with autism in the province of Ontario. Last week, I was in Saskatoon with 
uh, provincial, uh, federal, and territorial uh, ministers of social services and children, and I added my voice to a call for a national autism strategy. But I'm really looking forward to additional uh, town halls. We do have one coming up for northern and rural communities, as well as for francophone communities. I encourage all parents who have children on the spectrum to participate Response? in these telephone town halls, and I invite all MPPs, regardless of political affiliation, to participate as well with their own roundtables. Thank you. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this week, the Premier and the Minister of Finance took their partisan entourage down to New York City, all expenses paid by the public. When pressed about this issue, both the Premier and the Minister refused to reveal who exactly went on the trip and how much it actually costs the people of Ontario. If the Premier is so sure that his expenses on this trip are above board, why does he continue to stonewall the actual media and hide Order. the costs from this legislature? Question is to the Premier. Minister of Finance. To the Minister of well, Finance. Thank you, uh, Premier, and thank you very much for representing Ontario so very, very well in New York City this week. It was an honour. It was an absolute honour to join you in New York. I know the investors and the companies who are hoping to move to Ontario heard the positive message that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs that you delivered at the, uh, all of the meetings that we had. In fact, uh, Speaker, over the course of uh, the last two weeks, Ontario, who uh, has our bonds out in the marketplace, brought in $4.6 billion of the $36 billion that we need in our bonds. And fascinatingly, half of that money was in U.S. dollars. This is a huge uh, success for the province of Ontario. They are thrilled with the fact Response. that Ontario is open for business, open for jobs. They told the Premier and I that, that we haven't heard a solid message like that from Ontario in 15 years. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you very much. Well, those investors also value a strong public education system and a strong health care system, which you are currently undermining. The yet, side, come to costs, order. The, the yet untold costs of this trip are just the latest in a pattern from this Premier of using public dollars for his personal priorities, all while claiming that the province can't afford to provide essential services to Ontarians in need. The Premier's claims that we don't have enough money to fund flood prevention in the midst of record flooding, that we can't keep teachers in classrooms, and that we have to start charging people for health care coverage. But when he spends public money on himself, he thinks Ontarians don't deserve transparency or accountability. If the Liberals did this, you would be crying out loud. Order. Listen, you need to owe the people of this province the, the facts on this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Government side, come to order. Start the clock. Response, Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we are borrowing $36 billion this year so that we can have the money to put into health care and have that money to put in, into education. That's why we need to continue. We raised between 20 and 30 percent of all of that money has to come from outside of Canada, Speaker. And I can tell you that they heard a message that we are transforming, we are modernizing, we are digitizing government. They heard the story of how you can go to a uh, uh, how you can go online now and get your driver's license and get your health card. They saw that we're saving $33.5 million by doing that. They heard that we're saving four cents on every dollar, and that, as it turns out, we're saving almost eight cents on every dollar. They love the fact, they absolutely love the fact that we're returning $26 billion in relief to families through child care programs and through low-income tax incentives. They said to Response. us, the situation is better now in Ontario than it was 10 months ago. Yeah. Order. Order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question is the member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, despite the people of Canada making it clear in multiple provincial elections that they can't afford more new taxes, the federal government moved ahead with their Trudeau carbon tax, a tax that's going to raise the cost of everything. The Trudeau Liberals may claim that their new tax will in turn put more money back in people's pockets. Well, Speaker, let's be very frank. Anyone who tries to say that taking a tax will put more money in your pocket should have you thinking twice. Speaker, it's been a full month since the imposition of the Trudeau carbon tax, and I'm wondering if the minister can tell the House what the true cost of the Trudeau carbon tax is. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Niagara West, uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the great work you do representing your constituents. Mr. Speaker, the federal Liberals have gone to great extent to, uh, to say two things and to try to convince Ontarians of two things. One is that the only way to fight climate change is with a carbon tax, and we know that our made Ontario uh, climate plan proves that that is not true. The second is that a carbon tax will make people better off financially. Mr. Speaker, we learned some more about that this week. The federal parliamentary budget officer confirmed, Mr. Speaker, that the Trudeau carbon tax will take $6.2 billion out of the pockets wow. of the people of Canada. Of Canada. And Mr. Speaker confirmed that 90% of that is going to come from individuals, from families, not from big polluters. Mr. Speaker, the Response. PBO findings in the PBO in his interview said when asked, well, well, how do we know that money will go back to the people of Ontario, to the people of the provinces? He said, we just have to trust the Liberals. Mr. Wow. Speaker, this is a party in Ottawa that promised the budget would be balanced by this year. Mr. Speaker, there's 18 billion reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you. Answer. Uh, listen, Speaker, many of my constituents already struggle day to day with the cost of living even before this tax came into effect, and now it's going to be even harder for them to make ends meet. This tax jeopardizes the future of our economy and our families' prosperities. I'm happy to be part of a team that puts the people of Ontario first with every decision that we make. So, Speaker, my question to the Minister is uh, whether or not this uh, tax is going to hit our families where it hurts the most. We see already this cost of gas is rising, the cost of home heating, the cost of food. Speaker, can you explain to the people of Ontario uh, how much this carbon tax will really cost them? Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member, I thank the member for his question. Let's be clear. The carbon tax will raise the cost of everything. Mr. Speaker, the parliamentary budget officer, and I'm quoting him here, and I want to get it right, confirmed that a lot of the burden is going to fall on final consumers and households, Mr. Speaker. 90% of the burden. Mr. Wow. Speaker, families and seniors on fixed, in, fixed incomes will have to pay more to heat their homes. We've already talked about $27 billion, million dollars of costs for hospitals, $20 million for colleges and universities, $3.4 million for security services like the OPP and the people who support us. Mr. Speaker, Ontario doesn't need the Trudeau carbon tax. We have a Made in Ontario plan that will make sure that we hit the targets that the Prime Minister set. We're at 22 percent reduction emissions now. We'll get to 30 percent, and we'll get there without Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, this week the minister said that when her government removes out-of-country OHIP coverage, Ontarians should simply get their own insurance. Yeah. She stated that this can be purchased very inexpensively to cover medical needs. Well, Speaker, Kathy Duval lives in London West and contacted me to say that she can't get private insurance. She has renal failure, and like many people with chronic kidney disease, Disease, she requires hemodialysis three days a week. She said there are no insurance companies in Ontario that provide coverage for hemodialysis because of a pre-existing condition. Speaker, why is the minister forcing Kathy and others like her to pay entirely out of pocket for health care services if they must travel out of country? Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly am very sorry to hear about Kathy's situation. However, I think it's also important to be honest with the people of Ontario about what this program, first of all, cost and the level of coverage that they would be getting. This is a program that a third of the cost of the program was spent on administration. That's not good value for taxpayers. That's not good value for anybody in Ontario. But the other issue to be considered here is this poor woman has a, a significant 
significant condition that she would only receive under the existing program $400 in coverage. If she had a significant issue while she was out of that country, she would have thousands more in coverage in, in costs that would not be covered. So it is really important that we speak honestly to the people of Ontario Order. about what would have been covered and what would not have been covered. $400 Spons? is nothing compared to the cost that this woman could receive if she were having to be treated outside of the country. The member for Windsor West has to come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, refusing to reimburse out-of-country dialysis creates yet another hardship for people with kidney disease who are struggling to maintain some semblance of normal life. The Kidney Foundation of Canada says that eliminating out-of-country OHIP claims will literally handcuff dialysis patients to their machines, preventing them from traveling for personal, professional, or emergency reasons. Speaker, the, he the Canada Health Ca Act guarantees that every Ontarian should have access to publicly funded health care, whether they are at home or temporarily outside of Canada. Will the minister abandon her callous plan to deny OHIP coverage to Ontarians when they travel out of country? Government side, come to order. Minister reply. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, through you, I would say to the member opposite, we need to be realistic about this situation. If someone has a dialysis issue, they need to receive dialysis treatment several times a week. It's difficult for them to travel in any event. So, and the coverage that they would receive would be under this existing program would be nothing in compared to the costs that would actually cost them. So we have to be honest with the people of Ontario, not give them false hope that when they travel, they're going to have every single cost covered. When it's only only $400 to someone with uh, significant renal problems needing dialysis. There is a real concern that there might be something that go, goes wrong when they're traveling. It's difficult to travel and do dialysis. I acknowledge that. But to suggest that $400 is going to make a difference and allow them to travel, that is giving people absolutely oh, hope. Oh, and I am not going Order. to do that. that is, I have a responsibility here, here. as Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and I'm going to fulfill my responsibility to the people of Ontario. Stop the clock. Order. <laughs> Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Kitchener South Hesper. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. This past Tuesday, the Minister announced our government's digital plan for simpler, faster, better services. The goal of this plan, he explained, is to modernize government services to improve service delivery. I know, Mr. Speaker, that the constituents in my riding of Kitchener South Hespler are very happy to hear this. Many of my constituents have had to deal with delays in birth certificate processing or have complained about how services are available online. Our government is dedicated to putting people back at the centre of everything that we do, and I know that this Act will do just that. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister update this House on how this plan will improve service delivery for all Ontarians? The Minister of government and services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague, the member from Kitchener South Hasport, Amy Free, for her great work on behalf of her constituents to answer this question. Ontarians are used to banking and shopping online, making restaurant reservations and buying movie tickets on our phones. Yep. We're used to this because business recognized a long ago that bringing services online better meets customer needs. Unfortunately, this is not the case for Ontario. For far too long, out-of-date, overly bureaucratic processes reduce quality of service delivered to the people of Ontario. As part of our 2019 budget, our government introduced the Simpler, Faster, Better Services Act that, if passed, would significantly improve how government works, its digital outlook, and the services it delivers to the people and businesses of Ontario. Digital first does not, however, mean digital only. What we're doing is expanding access to meet people's expectations for service delivery across the province. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians have been living in the digital age for a while now. It's about time our government did the same. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. 
I'm certainly looking forward to voting in favor of the Simpler, Faster, Better Services Act. And I know my constituents are very excited to see that the provincial government services will actually enter the 21st century. Finally. As the minister rightly said, far too many Ontarians are inconvenienced by the lack of online services. And I know many of my constituents find it hard to travel in person to service Ontario locations when they need to renew a driver's license, health card, or register a new business. I'm sure the minister would agree that by modernizing the way government delivers these necessary services, Ontario will not only make life easier, but make better use of government resources and talent, as well as strengthening our commitment to making Ontario open for business. Mr. Speaker, could the minister provide the legislature with Question. more details about the plan? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member and I are in strong agreement on this topic. The legislation, introduced, if, the legislation introduced would, if passed, promote becoming digital first in three ways. First, it would enable adoption of digital practices across government, improving all digital platforms to increase online use for Service Ontario's top 10 transactions. It would eliminate outdated processes that prevent the delivery of people-centered services. This includes the badly outdated processes within Service Ontario. Finally, this legislation would allow us to unlock high-value data while protecting Ontarians' privacy to increase economic growth and prosperity for the people and the businesses of Ontario. And to reassure those with poor internet connections or who prefer visiting Service Ontario in person, I want to say again, digital first does not mean digital only. Our plan would protect brick-and-mortar locations and free up staff to focus their talents where they are needed most. Mr. Speaker, there's no excuse for Ontario to be stuck with 20th century processes Response. in 2019. Our government, the Ford government, is bringing government into the 21st century. Good answer. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Another day and another decision by this government to create business uncertainty. The 50 million trees program was abruptly cancelled last month. The owner of Milson Forest Service in Timmins, Jenny Milson, wrote to us to say that the program's cancellation has hurt her business. It has caused her to lose orders for hundreds of thousands of trees. She has talked to some of the other growers, and they're all in the same boat. Millions of trees will be dumped, and businesses will lose significant revenue, not to mention the lost opportunity to grow our forests. Premier, why are you throwing Jenny and other business owners like her into chaos? Questions to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, talk about uncertainty. We're giving businesses certainty. We're giving the forest industry the best stewards of the environment, the, the, the opportunity and the support to, to plant 67 million trees. Here. But do you know why we're doing this? I'm, I'm looking up in the stands Order. of all these young people here and behind me. My friends, go back and ask your parents. They're working hard in an office. They're working hard in a factory. They're actually, they're actually paying their taxes, trying to put food on their tables, trying to put their kids through education. Mr. Speaker, that's why we're doing it. We're doing it for the young people up there that want their parents to prosper. They want their parents to have more money in their pockets. We're protecting each and every single family that's up in the stand, here and behind me, because they can have a better job. Their parents can have a better job. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Order. And I think it's a good time to remind all members to make your comments through the chair. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, your, this question is to the Premier. Your decision to cancel the 50 million tree program will result in businesses losing money and millions of tree seedlings going to waste. That's for certain. What the young people of this province need is an environment that, that will sustain them in the future. Right. The government continues to cause business uncertainty in spite of how much they pat themselves on the back. And will the Premier reverse this bad decision and stop hurting small businesses and the environment? Right on. Right on. Members, please take your seats. 
Premier to reply. Minister of Infrastructure. Bird to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, here we are once again. Another question period. Almost every question that the NDP asks is a question defending the legacy of the Liberal government under Kathleen Wynne. It's uh, quite astonishing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's Order. make it clear. The forestry, forestry industry in the province of Ontario plants 68 million trees every single year in the province of Ontario. And, and Mr. Speaker, I know this isn't an issue uh, that the NDP uh, care about, but as the Premier said, we have lots of young children uh, in the legislature today. And you know what we care about, Mr. Speaker? We care about their future. Yeah. We care about uh, cleaning up the financial uh, mess left by the NDP and the Liberals. That's $15 billion deficit, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to put the debt on the backs of the young people of this province. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Agri agriculture plays a vital role in Ontario's economy as well as that in our neighbour, Quebec. In fact, Ontario and Quebec account for over one-third of 36 per cent of Canada's gross farm income. I was pleased to hear that Minister Hardiman and Quebec's Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Minister LaFontaine, met with Seattle Canada just weeks to tour some of the vendors who produce the best food in our provinces. Seattle is North America's largest food innovation trade show and provided an excellent venue to discuss the opportunities for enhanced collaboration between Ontario and Quebec's agriculture and food sectors. Could the minister please share with the House more details about the opportunities for innovation discussed at Seattle Canada? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from uh, Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry for that excellent question. Through our government's Open for Business Action Plan and Quebec's own Business Action Plan, both provinces have committed to reducing red tape. We are working hard to ensure that agri-food agri businesses aren't spending long hours navigating outdated, duplicated, and unnecessary regulations. We also recognize our shared responsibility for plant and animal health emergency management amidst many global concerns and threats. These are top priorities for both our governments. We will also ensure that the federal government delivers on its promise to full and fair compensation to alleviate the impacts of the CUSMA on the supply managed sectors. I look forward Bonds. to continuing to work with Quebec, the Quebec Minister to advance our shared interests and priorities for a successful and thriving agriculture sector. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. I appreciate all the work, all the hard work that he's been doing on behalf of Ontario's farmers. And I'm pleased to be part of a government committed to working with neighboring jurisdictions to advance our, our agriculture and food sectors. Strong agriculture and food sectors create jobs, increase investment, and ensure our rural communities re remain a, a great place to live, work, and to raise a family. Working together as partners, we have a real opportunity to grow agriculture and food in this province and in both Ontario and Quebec, both domestically and internationally. Can the minister please tell us what our government is doing to strengthen our relationships to create good paying jobs in both provinces? Minister. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and I thank the member for the supplementary question. I will be meeting with Minister Lamontagne once again in Quebec this July for the annual Federal, Provincial, Territorial Agriculture Minister's Meeting. This will provide an excellent opportunity to build on the success of our meetings at CL. We will work together on making sure the federal government and our counterparts across the country are aware of our shared priorities. 
supporting our supply managed industries, addressing agriculture's unique labour needs, and creating farmer friendly business environment are all the priorities we share and will continue to advocate for. I'm proud of the work our government has done so far, and we will continue to work with our provincial partners to ensure agribusinesses remain viable, innovative, and competitive on the world stage. Thank you very much for the question. That concludes the time we have for question period this morning. A number of members have informed me they wish to raise points of order. I'll start with the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would like to recognize the men and women from the Royal Canadian Navy that are here with us today at Queen's Park. In six days on May 8th marks the 74th anniversary for the Battle of Atlantic, which was a major part of our naval history of the Second World War. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for being here. Member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, earlier this week, during question period in the legislature, I referenced a letter I received from a highly credible source concerning interlibrary loans, which I have since learned may not have originated from the office of the member for Niagara West. I want this House to know that although I profoundly disagree with this government's policy decisions and their heinous cuts to libraries, I would never knowingly resort Parker. to fallacious information as the basis for question period, Mr. Speaker. I work from a place of truth and integrity. It's the only way I know how. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Sergeant of our Arms and her team for chasing down the individual that chose to deface this amazing institution that Ontario calls their home, Queen's Park. Thank you publicly to you, Sergeant of Arms, and your team. The member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to invite all the members to join the, uh, our Navy officers, our Navy, our Navy officers on the staircase uh, for a photo. Uh, question period. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Davenport has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Education concerning cuts to education and increased class sizes. This matter will be debated Tuesday, May 7, 2019, at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for University Rosedale has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Transportation concerning changing transit plans. This matter will be debated Tuesday, May 7, 2019, at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Thunder Bay Atacokan has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Premier concerning cuts to the tree planting program. This matter will also be debated Tuesday, May 7, 2019, at 6 p.m. We're going to be busy. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 100, an act to implement budget measures and to enact, amend, and repeal various statutes. Call in the members. This is a five minute bell.
I ask members to please take their seats. Please take your seats. <laughs> On April 17, 2019, Mr. Fidelli moved second reading of Bill 100. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Beckham Fall. Mr. Beckham Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Mr. Miller Perry Sam Mr. Leche. Mr. Leche. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Trantafilopoulos. Ms. Trantafilopoulos. Mrs. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith, Peter Burkworth. Mr. Smith, Peter Burkworth. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanny Gaston. Mr. Tanny Gaston. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Tabby. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rikosovic. Mr. Rikosovic. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. The ayes are 64, the nays are 35. The ayes being 64 and the nays being 35, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the order of the House dated May 1, 2019, the bill stands referred to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.